Hello and welcome to the Inside Intelligence Lecture Series brought to you by the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features a discussion with strategic foresight and global trend expert, Matt Burroughs. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note, today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Inside Intelligence playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and we will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Dr. Michael Ard, Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program. Thank you very much, Peter, and welcome everybody to Inside Intelligence and our program today, which is on the making of Global Trends 2030. And with us is Dr. Matthew Burroughs, who is a leading expert on strategic foresight and global trend analysis. He is currently program lead of the Stimson Center's Strategic Foresight Hub and a distinguished fellow with the Reimagining U.S. Grand Strategy Program. Prior to joining Stimson, he served as the Director of Foresight at the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Strategy Initiative and as the co-director of the New American Engagement Initiative. In 2013, he retired from a 28-year-long career in the State Department and Central Intelligence Agency, the last 10 years of which he spent at the National Intelligence Council, our premier analytic unit in the U.S. intelligence community. In 2007, Matt was appointed counselor, the number three position in the NIC, and was the principal drafter of the NIC publication, Global Trends 2030, Alternative Worlds which received widespread recognition and praise in the international media. In 2005, he set up the NICS Long Range Analytic Unit, which is now known as the Strategic Futures Group. Some of his other positions include assignment as Deputy National Security Advisor to Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, Special Assistant to UN Ambassador Richard Holbrook, and the first holder of the Intelligence Community's Fellowship at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Matt received a BA in American and European history from Wesleyan University and a PhD in European history from the University of Cambridge. Matt, it's great to have you with us today. We're really looking forward to uh, our discussion here on uh, Global Trends 2030. And let me uh, just mention one thing, everybody. Uh, this is the fifth edition of Global Trends. Um, now we're on the seventh edition, I believe, uh, which came out in 2021. But Matt, is uh, the author of three of the global trends, and as we were just discussing, is still the clubhouse leader in uh, producing global trends reports. So, Matt, I'm over to you. Well, thank you, Michael, and it's great to be uh, here with everybody. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the origins of the global trends publication, which gives some insight into. When you come up to the to the last one I did, which was the 2030 edition, you know how we went about doing that. The global trends uh, editions began in the mid 1990s. Um, there is it, at the time there was a classified, very small um, publication that both the State Department's um, State Department and the um, National Intelligence Council um, published. Uh, it was not very well known, uh, largely because it was classified. And the first, I think, the first real global trends was published in 2000. And that one was called Global Trends 2015. Now, if you look on the title of that, and it's still available, it's called Dialogue with Non-Governmental Experts. And that's very important. The concept really was to get outside the intelligence community and to actually bring in expertise from the broader US academic business, other communities which were thinking about future trends. And it was motivated in part by um, the CIA director at that time, Woolsey, 
who believed that the particularly CIA analysts were too stuck in the Cold War. And now you had this period of, of real openness, globalization, and all of that really hadn't sunk in um, to the analysis when they're thinking about um, international relations and what is going on in, in all the regions. So the effort he brought in actually somebody, a uh, um, woman who had worked a lot at the UN, this was Enid Schuttle, um, to really uh, do that publication, the Global Trends 15. Um, it did have all the NIOs, so all the national intelligence officers uh, in the uh, NIC who, who wrote different parts of that uh, publication. I joined after, um, uh, I joined the NIC in 2003. At that time, it had a new chair who was Ambassador uh, Robert Hutchings. He, um, I know uh, he told me later, he hired me because I'd had all of these positions outside. I'd been detailed to uh, various, like Treasury up to New York, um, to work with Holbrook, and he wanted somebody that had a broader perspective than you would find if you just stayed in the in the analytic trenches in the in the at at home in at, at Langley. So uh, within a couple of months, he told me I was going to write the next global trends. At that, I knew glo about global trends, but I had really never. Uh, you know, thought that I ever would be uh, the principal author in this, organizing the the whole effort and writing it. Uh, and you know, one of the you would say one of the real strong points of the global trends is that it's very comprehensive. It deals with all the regions. It deals with these big global trends, everything uh, from demographics to economic energy and so on. And even though I had, uh, after serving up in New York and, and uh, Treasury, I had a pretty broad um, understanding of what was happening in various parts of the world outside of my specialty, which had been Europe. It was difficult to get your head around this and to organize the publication in such a way that it's very readable. It's very easy to, um, you know, to go from one topic to the next. At the same time, it's a good reference for people who are just interested in one particular area and, and not the other. So one of the, when I began on this journey, I first was looking back to global trends and 2015, and that had been organized in terms of trends. So you had about a dozen trends um, there, and they were about the different regions, but they were also on these big issues of energy, economics, um, health was a was a big one. Demography, um, uh, conflict, nonproliferation. So all the issues that you know are handled by uh, analysts in the IC, and which were you know represented by one or one or the other of the of the NIOs. Um, and then it had a very small section on scenarios. And if you read global trends, there is an assumption that con con there's going to be more continuity than change. By the time that I was beginning to write this, and it was, you know, it's an effort by you're leading the charge, but you're also um, getting a lot of help from the NIOs. We had really changed our idea about uh, this continuity versus change and believed basically that change was much more predominant than continuity and would be over the next 15 years, because this publication is trying to look out 15 years. 
So if you follow from the first publication I did 2004, which is Global Trends 2020, and a lot, it's already been judged since we're past 2020, gotten pretty good marks. And then the next one was four years later, 2008, and that was 2025. And the final one is, was in 2012 or 2013. And on 2030, the length of the scenario sections have grown. And that was a big change because we spent uh, more and more time really thinking about the scenarios. And that involved, particularly on the first one, but that continued right through to 2030, reaching out to places like Shell, which has a long history of doing uh, scenarios. And we uh, actually, the how we portrayed the scenario, which was, in a fictional manner, was inspired by um, Betty Sue Flowers, who was the uh, writer for Shell uh, on all their scenarios. And I remember, you know, one of her key pieces of advice was scenarios are like a theater. You don't, you, you have to watch on putting too much detail because you don't know if you are writing a scenario on the future of Russia, for example, you don't know if Putin's going to die, live, or whatever, but you have to still portray maybe in one scenario, his passing and a new regime, and that could happen in several different ways. You have to be a little bit, find a way of being a little bit vague about that. On the other hand, you have to find vehicles for basically getting your reader out of the current and switching on a different part of his or her brain that gets you immediately into a different environment. Now, if you notice, if you go to a theater, that's what happens. There's very, a set, a set is like a Potemkin village. You know, it's if you're portraying uh, a sitting room um, in a drama, not everything is real. The windows don't look out on a on a, a, a green lawn and, and forest beyond. It is all fake. But you give enough of that illusion that you're convincing the audience this is a real place. And that is the the really secret of doing a scenario too many. What we tried throughout was really by using the fictional, making a story that we could catapult uh, people into the future. Now, a little bit about the mechanics of doing this, um, because um, one of the other big changes was we took this, this concept of reaching out, getting opinion from elsewhere and bringing it in, um, we multiplied that by, I don't know, you know, three or four times. And we also expanded it outside the US. So by the time I did it in 2012, and this has continued today, it, we, had, we were going to 20 countries. We were also going specifically to get different points of view. We went to China, we went to Russia, we went a lot of in, in Latin America, South Africa, every, you know, there was a growing interest in the rest of the world in this publication. And I'll end on that, talk a little bit about, you know, how it how it became a, a sort, of, sort of global industry now to think about, about the future. Um, but we were going everywhere. A lot of it was there was a lot of demand for for an understanding of what was happening. And I think for the for the US, particularly after 9-11, and we've had a series of disruptions, global trends has been, it hasn't been, you know, we have predicted some of those. I mean, we had I had a scenario um, basically about uh, the caliphate 
And you had a few years later, I mean, in Iraq, you had ISIS having that same idea of developing a, a caliphate. We had a, a one scenario in which, you know, there was a movement, get rid of a populist movement in the U.S., which you could say anticipated what happened with the Trump election. Uh, and we also had a hurricane in, in New York like we did in 2012 with Sandy, it happened years before. And most recently, if you look at what we had on uh, wild cards, we had a very long uh, analysis of the pandemic. And the scenario was exactly what happened. We had a higher mortality rate, but at that time we didn't know about the new vaccines. So you can actually, you know, these are usually considered wild cards or black swan. You can anticipate some of that. You usually can't pinpoint it to a particular year or time. Uh, but nevertheless, in doing that, what policymakers find useful is uh, having some understanding of what the surprises, shocks could be, some understanding to of what trends are fixed because we differentiated in the in the publication what are trends like demography that are more or less fixed over a 15 year point that you can't shape in much way you have to deal with uh, and others in which there was a lot more ability for policymaker decision makers to, to really uh, reshape so um these were, you know, they were briefed to all to presidents, all of them. I did uh, Obama and Bush twice, um, and they were importantly used by policy planning shops, uh, and they particularly found it valuable because it gave them when something was breaking. It gave them an idea of, of how to think about it, and from there begin to to develop some strategies or policies uh, to deal with it. It had a huge following outside of the U.S. It's been translated by the Chinese. Everyone I did, no censorship on what, even though there were were not necessarily positive statements about China. It was big following in India. Um, so it uh, it has created, I would say, in, in the European Union, which it actually created, they created their own office to do similar work. So it's it's had that effect. I do think that, you know, there still needs to be work in incorporating what we know could happen much more into the decision making process so you're not you're not dealing with crisis so much crisis management but also you're you're trying to prevent some things that you know could happen from happening uh, i think i'll stop there uh, michael um, probably used up a little bit more of my time than i should have but welcome yours and other questions Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'll have a few questions and then we'll turn it over to our audience. Uh, and everybody, um, you can ask your questions either in the chat or the Q&A function and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Uh, Matt, I'd like to actually step back for a second and ask you a question about your own education and your PhD in history. And I wondered how much that background in uh, your thinking as a historian uh, helped you in putting a project like this together? I think, it, uh, I mean, you know, training of a historian, when you think that what you do as a historian, you try to explain how events, uh, why events happen. You try to explain why the Russian re Revolution erupted when it did. You try to explain the French Revolution or the Civil War in the U.S. So, in that sense, you have to learn about thinking about different factors and why, what are the different triggers um, for this particular event? What what are the in the background more? What big factors 
uh, were enabling um, this event to, to happen. So when you're thinking about the future, you, it's, it's likewise you you can think about different factors interacting in such a way that increases the likelihood of an event happening. And that's, I think, that, that's, you know, what the historic training really provides. And also, you know, historians, when they're writing, usually gravitate to the disruptive events. That's what we like to explain. We don't like to explain continuity as much, um, even though that's part of the what you have to do to to, to understand what the how there was this discontinuity, this disruption. Um, but you know, a lot of analysts, I think, um, they fall into a trap of looking out linearly into the future and think about incremental change. Whereas I say that policymakers really are not so worried about that. They're really worried about, uh, about a, an event coming out of the blue that they have never been told about or, or doesn't seem like it's, it's quite logical or should happen. I mean, 9-11 is the, the obvious one, but their whole score of of events like that has happened, so that's the the type of thing they're really trying to uh, looking to the intelligence community to help them with. One of the um, in your talk, uh, you mentioned about how many different experts, different meeting uh, conferences, things like that, that were put together for um, uh, to help build up this report. But um, you also had, it seemed to me, a somewhat a unique approach, which was having a blog uh, associated with the report, which the uh, various um, experts ran. Could you comment on that a little bit? And how is that, is that still being used to help uh, uh, channel ideas into the building of the report? Um, that was an idea, as I said, we got a lot of help from, you know, outside i mean they would initiate things i mean talk to us about you know they had this idea for in this case for doing a blog particularly among ir um professors because we had run uh a series of quarterly workshops with ir specialists and um so they were interested actually in you know, writing a blog on, you know, I would give them ideas of what we were, the topics we were struggling with a little bit. Um, so in order to gather information, but also to, in order to analyze, particularly in terms of, of looking out um, 15 years, and that's part of the, you know, the, the challenge here is that you're, you always want to keep in mind that it's going to be a different reality. Um, and they were they were very helpful in that regard. Uh, I would say the other thing that the academics did, and again, and they offered, and we took them up readily, was um, they went back and they analyzed um, the previous works um, in this series, how well we had done, uh, what were the gaps? Uh, what what things did we have to work on? And that was featured. We decided to put a summary of that, of what their conclusions were in the 2030. They're in a box in uh, towards the beginning of the of the 2030 work. And I think that um, if you're going to do this work, you also have to examine, you know. What what you did wrong on the, on the last one, or what you should yeah. have done better, um, all of those things, because that's the way you get better at this, um, and you shouldn't be too discouraged. I mean, this is this is difficult work, picking out the you know the kind of shocks and surprises that um, that uh, others are not paying enough attention to. 
One of the, and what about, you know, a lot of the reports I would imagine, I mean, I've read some of them, I haven't read all of them, but uh, when you look at mega trends, I mean, that, these don't change that much. Or did you find that uh, maybe uh, in the course of writing, you know, your three uh, uh, global trends projects, that you did uh, make some changes to what you considered to be the mega trends that were the drivers? Uh, well, we felt um, after the second one I did, so this is 2025 in 2008, that we weren't paying enough attention to technology. Mm -hmm. And at that time, and this I think has is, is changed, um, you know, the community was focused on more military um, technology and not, you'd say, the civilian technologies that were being developed in, in Silicon Valley and how that was beginning to change, completely transform uh, everyone's lives and the economy and so on. So we spent quite a bit of time with uh, people in the Valley and, else, and elsewhere to really get an understanding of what would be the disruptive trend, uh, technology trends um what ways they would be disruptive on what things and disruptive can be positive and negative um and we were looking for positives remember we did a lot on like precision uh agriculture precision irrigation things that could help with uh what we saw as a uh as a food crisis in the future because of a still growing population and particularly in certain regions like Africa that have had a hard time of feeding themselves. So that was, um, I think, you know, one of the big things we early on, um, and the NIC changed, they've um, actually established um, a civil technology NIO, which was held by an academic actually, uh, who was looking at a lot of those, those emerging technologies. At uh, the first one, we uh, we also looked at South Asia a lot more. So there was a decision by Ambassador Hutchings to break, um, you know, the, the Middle East and the South Asia were, were together in one chair, one office and held by one national intelligence officer, NIO. So there was a decision because of the work we did looking particularly at South Asia uh, to make that a, spe uh, a an NIO office on its on its own and increase because we saw obviously with Afghanistan and other it wasn't just Afghanistan it was uh, India Pakistan um, we saw that as a growing uh, area of of concern for the US um, so those were the, um, you know, I, th I think economics was probably the other thing that um, there was too much complacency about um, globalization. And we were, we were one of the first to talk about, you know, the, the downside of globalization. The other big thing, and that started right at the beginning, was we took the position that China wasn't going to fall into some US-led global system. And that was very controversial with policymakers um, to say that even, but that was uh, when we briefed the, the 2020 uh, global trends, we said, you know, China, seeing it's a, believing it's an ancient civilization with um, being one of the, at that time, biggest country in the world, uh, population wise i mean they they wouldn't see themselves easily fitting into a into a us led system let's go to some of the questions from our audience now matt i um i want to start with uh, a question from akina and uh, akina asked about um interested in publications on continuity and change that you mentioned and maybe we can broaden this question a little bit about what do you see, and you mentioned Shell and Shell's uh, um, long history of doing this types of future analysis as a company, right? 
But what are what are some of the what do you consider um, uh, say classic tests in looking at uh, futures analysis that might help some of our listeners? Well, I would say um, you know on the scenarios, understanding you know you have two giants. One is Herman Kahn, so uh, in the U.S. at Rand, where he was looking at nuclear deterrence and particularly with in this bipolar US Soviet world I think and then developing scenarios and I think we we will probably be doing that again because you're seeing China be, become up up boost its its nuclear force and become a almost a peer to US and the Soviet Union. So you also have to begin to, to look at these different permutations, you could say, of, of how nuclear war would come out or how nuclear deterrence could, could actually be established. It's much more difficult with more players. Um, so his work, I think, is still valid. Um, I think um, on the Shell side, the founder there was Pierre Vac. Um, and there's some good articles looking at, um, he was a wide ranging, uh, you know, was immersed at one time in Eastern philosophies, mysticism. At the same time, he was dealing with the energy world. Um, as, but he is his kind of philosophy for for scenarios, which, as I said, were were very influential with us. So there have been some some uh, works uh, about him. Um, and I, I think if you look at the Economist has a series on ifs is is actually a very good way of beginning to think about. Um, you know, we would say the the unconventional, different way, alternative uh, futures. So when they they have a series, usually comes out at Christmas. You know, if if Putin dies, what happens? If you know she dies, or or uh, we have a China U.S. China war, what happens? So uh, training yourself that way in thinking about, okay, it doesn't seem likely at this point, but what if it happens? What does that mean? And um, so that that really is a very good um, way. There is a, in a practical sense, there's a very good publication by the British MOD, and I can try and send uh, the link to, to Michael and to pass along, but basically it goes through all the different methodologies in a very practical way. So if you want to have a conference, you know, tells you how many people, what are the, how many teams you have to establish, how long it would take. I mean, it's an excellent um, basic uh, guide to, to the different methodologies. So I, I always suggest those, um, those works, and I do have a, a reading list I can send around for kind of getting a sense of what this this work is about. Thanks very much. I mean, one of the I mean, we read about Pierre Walk, by the way, uh, is uh, is is described in uh, Peter Schwartz's book, uh, The Art of the yes. Long View. And you know, if anyone's yeah. interested in getting an introduction to this type topic, uh, that's a great place to start. Um, Okay, let's uh, another question from David. Uh, he asked you, uh, to what extent do you feel current advances in artificial intelligence, chat GPT comes to mind, and other uh, IA resources will have in formulating future global trend issues? You know, I think it can be a valuable, the new AI, I mean, a very valuable resource. Uh, particularly, I mean, we're developing something with a British firm, actually, my present business, looking, using AI to develop, you know, scenarios that we may not think about. 
but it's not as if you can, you know, start a chat box search and out comes Global Trends 2030 or whatever you're you're going to do. There's a lot of, you know, actually human interaction because you some of these, what you get using AI doesn't really make sense. And then you have to watch out that it's making up things. So um, it it is a very valuable research resource in that because there's so much data now out there, which you can't possibly um, look at all of it and and uh, read all of it and really uh, integrate all of it into your thinking, it can help with that. You know, um, you know, this is particularly valuable, I would say, on some of the horizon scanning. Um, but in terms of, you know, say, doing the final analysis when you have to weigh different different trends and you have to see where they interact, it's I think it is less good. And the fact that it's very hard to figure out sometimes why it comes to some conclusions, it can be uh, it can be. Um, more harmful than beneficial. I want to ask a question from Bob, who talks about, um, can you ask, can you address uh, global trends influence on policy making a little more specifically? Um, for, for example, and um, the US policymakers want more or less in global trends about US actions, perceptions, et cetera. Um, what did you find about that? I don't. I don't think uh, U.S. policymakers wanted more necessarily about the U.S. They were very worried because, beginning in two thousand eight with Global Trends twenty twenty five, we we talked about a relative decline of the U.S., which uh, for them it wasn't. They didn't particularly like that in a U.S. government document. Uh, we thought that you know this is more factual than anything else. Um, but but so they they don't have a high appetite. I mean, if you went outside, I mean, even among allies, remember briefing in Britain, I mean, that was the first question that they have about, you know, what what's happening to the US role? What how do uh how how did some of these trends impact U.S. strategy? Um, it was, uh, I, I think, you know, there are some policymakers, and particularly towards the senior level, who are very interested in this because, as I said, they're very interested in in being warned about shocks and surprises, things that they would not have thought about. And that was, I think, particularly with Obama um, case, because President Wright, you know, after Bush, and shortly after 9-11. Mm -hmm. So that 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 is usually their their focus. Um, you know, some of them use it as a vehicle then to go the next step and you have you know, a series of interactions with them to dig deeper into some of the trends. Um, I would say more the working level, there were some people very interested on the working level, but it was more of a personal uh, interest because at that level, I mean, things were day to day, they're not thinking out to, to, to you know, 2030 or whatever it is. Um, and they were not necessarily interested in their work that the global trends wasn't that relevant to, uh, except for places like policy planning. Um, and obviously in the strategy office in the White House, where <clears throat> they were interested in the document, but oftentimes it was a first step to further analysis that they wanted. And, and that stuff. Uh, was inevitably classified. 
I'm going to ask a question from Jim, and then I'm going to have to deal with a, a technical issue. So keep so talk expansively. Um, I have uh, he asks in terms of usefulness to policymakers. Do you think they found the scenarios less useful than the drivers used to create them, and how they might be influenced? And uh, to what extent does global trends? Uh, is used by the intelligence community to identify, develop, and observe indicators. So again, it's you know there wasn't a a, a rule here that uh, you know all policymakers are the same. We dealt with extensively with Tom Donilon. Uh, I remember on Global Trends twenty thirty. He delves specifically into the scenarios. Uh, and at that, we did scenarios and we had McKenzie offered to do the quantitative analysis of it. Um, so looking at, at big things, what it would mean for GDP, including GDP of the US. Uh, they were really interested in that. And there was a lot of information that we, we provided uh, Tom Donilon. Um, I, you know, I am not sure beyond that uh, <laughs> how it got incorporated, except, uh, you know, if you examine the national security strategy uh, and other things, you know, the the first one I did 2020 made the big case that, that, the big long-term interest and concern for the U.S. was about the rise of um, other great powers, including obviously China. And at that time, when we were writing this, it was all war on terror. And, you know, if you look at Global Trends 2020, where do you find the terror part towards the end? And that was intentional to send a message that in terms of the longer term, what's happening with the BRICS is actually going to be of more vital interest. That message was taken on board and you did see switch. And we weren't the only ones saying that at that time that, that um, there, there needed to be much more of a focus on that. Um, but we certainly were ones pointing out that it, the, this wasn't going to be easy. You know, China wasn't going to be like Japan or South Korea and be, you know, kind of partners within a U.S. system. Um, There's a second part to that sentence, to that question. I think I was. Uh, the. Uh, uh... To what extent did the intelligence community then use the uh, indicators yeah. identified? Yeah. The intelligence community was very good about, uh, and, and a part that I think, uh, you know, when you're developing this, you're developing this over two years. There are a lot of meetings within the intelligence community. And, the, and also, uh, you know, I was a period, I was segueing from the, CIA director who took a tenant took a, a personal interest in in global trends uh, to um, the DNI and there was a lot of interest in I would say both the scenarios and and the trends and you know because the the Nick is can be a leader on on uh, indicating we need to look at new new areas and new questions and so on. I think that that also helped that this is embedded within the NIC uh, where it can also, uh, in a way, gently force the rest of the community to look at some issues because some of the NIOs took up some of these issues as well in their own work. A little bit uh, beyond the scope of uh, this, uh, our 2030 discussion, but uh, certainly there was a lot of talk on uh, what Russia would do. There was different uh, 
uh, it identified different directions Russia could go in. Uh, Andrew asks, uh, what do you think, uh, Matt, about uh, the war in Ukraine? What, what, how do you think that that will uh, impact uh, global trends in the next two to three years? Uh, I wrote um, a part of the global trends, as I mentioned, that we we went to to Moscow and, and Beijing, and I developed partnership with MMO in Moscow, which is their forecasting uh, uh, body. It's in the Russian Academy of Sciences. It does um, continues to do very good work, and in 2016. I was in the think tank world at the Atlantic Council at that time. And um, with backing from the Carnegie Corporation, I did a, a global trends with MMO. And the first scenario is war in Ukraine. Um, so I think it was evident then, I mean, to a lot of Russian analysts that, uh, you know, the, the war, at which basically started with a seizure of, of Crimea, um, wasn't over and it was going to become bigger. And, and we encapsulated that in, in a broader uh, scenario on really the breakup of, of the world into um, a sort of new Cold War. I think you have to be you know, it's uh, I've labeled it a new Cold War with the twist in which you have a, a bigger number of countries that don't want to play in it. I mean, you're seeing that with the global south. Uh, but I think it's clear that uh, we're at the end of this phase of globalization. Um, you know, there's certain things like technologies, which will keep us maybe more more connected than than it after then when you look historically at the end of, of other phases of globalization in which we, there was a clear break. But nevertheless, I think uh, you're seeing the, the global, uh, the international relations uh, being uh, severely impacted in, in a breakup of, of, the, of economic and political uh, relations into blocks. Uh, and Ukraine war is one of those, both a symptom and I would say a cause. Um, but in the scenario, which is something we have to watch, maybe at the same time, uh, the Taiwan issue breaks out and you have a U.S. China, U.S. China war. Which has Jenna, yeah, so let me see if I can encapsulate this question a little bit for you, uh, Jana, because. Um, you know, you mentioned about, like in this report, 2030, did talk about the wild card of, the pan of a pandemic, uh, a war something that could be worse than what had been seen before. Um, how do we make something like that a, a forecast more um, relevant to policymakers or more uh, pressing on policymakers so that they can you know, move move resources to something like that, or is that even the purpose of this type of report? It should be the purpose, and I think it was certainly under surprisingly under the Bush administration. They they took those health um, crises very seriously, and we did a lot on bird flu. Um, Actually, this is separate from the global trends. And we actually, Bush um, got the, a lot of Asian countries to really focus on, on the um, impacts from a, from a bird flu that began, you know, started obviously with, with um, birds, but then it, there was the human to human transmission, which is the big change and what happened in the pandemic um, and the potential implications of that. He also was, and during that period, along with global trends, the, the NIC put out a big publication on HIV in Africa. It spurred a lot of, one thing, it brought a lot of pressure down on African countries to really take the HIV 
um, threat seriously. Um, and it also spurred some US leadership on that. We worked very closely with NIH. We worked closely with Fossey's office on this, on all these scenarios. Um, I do think, you know, a problem is that with something like the pandemic, there is no way that you can say what day, when it's coming. You can say where it's coming from. It's, it's relatively easy to, to pinpoint that, but um, you can't say when. And unless, you, you know, unless you have somebody there, I mean, I think Bush had a feeling after 9-11 that he had to pay a lot more attention day to day to threats like that. But that, that you know, fear uh, wanes after a time. And then you have change of administration. And of course, under the Trump administration, they eliminated the health office in the embassy in Beijing, where before that we were having um, basically that health office could, could help monitor and um, basically develop some ties with the health institutes, including the, the Wuhan one in China, and that was eliminated. He also eliminated, uh, I believe, the office in the NSC dealing with health. So uh, I'm not sure how you, <laughs> how you, you know, we have a system where you have that those changes, administrations always. Uh, reorganize the NSC, there's a reorganize organization of the intelligence community every so often. There are some some uh, losses with, with that. And I think that was one of the contributing factors is you didn't have somebody there who could um, pass along the warnings and make it clear that this was going to be something big. So uh, Kevin asks about the BRICS, and you know that's something that comes up in the reports and subsequent global trends. Um, do you see that where the BRICS perhaps become more aligned politically or in security matters, uh, something akin to NATO or the EU? I don't see uh, BRICS turning into a, a NATO, uh, particularly. Um, they're trying to do a currency. I think even that will have problems. But I do think that they are aligned in that they have a belief that the, you know, the Western world wants to dominate but doesn't want to to pay attention to the needs of the of the global South and in fact ignores them. Um, so you saw that with the pandemic is the vaccines uh, basically were 90% were bought up by, by uh, advanced economies. So you have that, that feeling that, that, you know, Western world looks after itself and we come second. And that's, you know, that's basically why Russia, China, other have the influence they do because they make the case there, in China's case, you're a developing country. And some of that isn't, you know, China doesn't always, uh, you know, do well by the by the others. But if you look statistically, they give a lot more assistance. They have the Belt and Road. There are a lot more programs. Uh, and I think there's a lot more identification still with the developing world. All right, um, a couple of questions. Do you see, um, uh, Pearl asks about, does anyone, or have you sense that anyone looking at these reports making bigger bets on the economic future? Do they look at it and say, oh, maybe we need to change our holdings on energy or, uh, or other um, companies based on what, say, a global trends report would come up with? Um, they, when I used to take it up to New York um, to brief um, like banks and others, at that time they were looking at what are the opportunities. And so then it came up 
on some of what we were talking about, economic growth and some, uh, you know, not just China, but other areas around the world. I think today, based on the questions I get, they are far more interested in the geopolitics side because for them now, the biggest source of risk is geopolitics. So what happens between US and China? And that, so there has been kind of a change from how they, how they looked on it. Um, and they, they didn't, you know, I have to say they didn't pay enough attention to the geopolitics. Um, when we were making some warnings, they were looking just for the opportunities there. Um, now they are fully seized with the geopolitics. Well, I want to, uh, we're getting uh, close to the end here, and these have been great questions, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, your participation. Um, I would like to uh, wrap up with something, and Megan asked about um, uh, the role of the NIC and the um, finished production with the rest of the intelligence community. And let me see if we can run that because with Matt, with your great experience in National Intelligence Council, how do you see uh, the NIC as guiding the intelligence community or helping shape, helping it think uh, on its own forecasting? What have you seen the role uh, it played over the years? I think it it helped, you know, I would say not so much global trends because this is a publication every four years. Um, and most, most, you know, the intelligence, most of the intelligence product is much more short term. I mean, the, the NIC products were, I would say in most cases, three to five years out. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think there are some problems when you're looking at the uh, analysis. So the way that the reforms changed analysis after 9-11 and after the Iraq uh, war in that the, you, you had to marshal a lot more evidence. So we became evidence-based. And in some way that that prevents you from seeing some longer term changes and also some some real surprise and shocks because intelligence is not you know is a is a snapshot uh, you it can't tell you there's no piece of intelligence that can tell you that this you're going to see uh in an you know, they did very good on the, the invasion of Ukraine, but that was just months before. And global trends is a different way of thinking. And I think um, in some ways we need some some recalibration so that there is less emphasis on just evidence-based. I mean, obviously it's important to have some grounding, but at the same time, there needs to be some area, just not in global trends, where you can think about um, different futures, different pathways. Now, the you know there is a red cell, which which I think has that that kind of mission where you're thinking about alternative, but I think it needs to be far more embedded, just in in the in in analysis. And certainly for a lot of policymakers, the ones I um tend to interact with in, that's what they see as a is a problem. Um it's it's too for, focused on the current, too uh likely to talk about linear developments and not open to to speculating a little bit, even if it's uh, speculating with some expertise and, and so behind it uh, about a, a different alternative uh, outcome. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, we're at the top of the hour now, um, and uh, we'll 
be uh, closing up our program. I want to thank Matt Burroughs very much for this outstanding discussion about the making of global trends and um, all his insights on, on uh, forecasting and the role it can play uh, for analysis in general. Um, and uh, we'll follow up with you. Uh, Matt said that he has a list of readings. Uh, we'll see if, uh, if uh, participants would like to contact me on that. I will uh, we'll send you a copy. If, uh, Matt will be good enough to forward it. Uh, likewise, I don't yeah, know. I'll do that after, right, right away after uh, yeah, the end of the yeah, session. That's right. Thanks. And I don't know about uh, so the question came up about the UK MODs um, links. I don't know if you do you know about that. I don't. Know. I, I have that. Um, I, I have the link to that publication, and it will be in the list. So. Okay, great. And uh, also, if anyone would like uh, to get a recording of this, uh, please look at our uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University Advanced Academic Programs YouTube channel. Uh, where we'll have a recording posted in the next day or two. And uh, also, uh, my, uh, please uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I, I'll also post it there as well. So thanks again, Matt. Uh, looking forward to having you back on our program, Inside Intelligence. Thank you. And thanks to everyone uh, in the audience. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.